Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eighth session of the 10 part spiritual journey into Massar with Rabbi Lauren Berman. Today, we'll be discussing Seder. Rabbi Lauren, take it away. Sure. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Good to see you again. Um, hello to all of our listeners. We're going to skip the review this time of our past Midot and just jump right in. Uh, some of these Midot may come up. The ones that we've done in the past might come up throughout our time, like Zrizut, um, the, the, what's called the Tachshit, the adornment of the other Midot, the, the, the alacrity we talked about, Zrizut, the Mida. Um, the, but the Mida that we're going to be doing today, Seder, uh, is a valuable Mida in and of itself. And it's actually one that can help us, I think, get started on our own Musar curriculum, the, the Midah of Seder, the Midah of Order. So today we'll study Seder, we will study order, and I will be the first to admit that this is awfully difficult to teach about. Uh, why? Because it's one of those that I feel is so important, I know it's so important, and yet I really, really struggle with it a lot. Uh, as we'll see, living a life of Seder means living an intentional, a directed, and a structured life. Seder is intended to, to really infuse all elements of our life, our physical spaces, our bodies, our schedules, our occupations, our relationships with others, and of course, our relationship with Torah and spirituality. Uh, a life of Seder is one that is structured, yet flexible, and it allows uh, us to flow through life, but with purpose and direction. Seder is manifest in the universe, in the physical world, both out there and in our own physical spaces, and in our own internal lives as well. I'm gonna start with a question because I think as hard of a Mida as Seder can be, I think or hope we all can have an answer to this question and actually sense that we do have at least a little bit of Seder in our lives. And the question is this, is there anything in your life that is a non-negotiable? Something that is of ultimate and pretty much absolute value, something that is really at the top of your priorities and it's very, very difficult uh, for something else to beat it out. Something that could be a fixed part of your day or your week or a year, something that takes priority over everything else and anything else that might get, at, get, might get in the way of it, nine times out of 10, you're not gonna budge. So that's my question. And we can, uh, I want you to just feel free to put in the chat if, if anything comes to mind for you and I'll try to, 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 to comment on some of that as we, as we go. But I believe if you have an answer to that question, right, if, the, if you have something like that in your life, then you should give yourself a pat on the back because that is a sign that you have some Seder in your life. Yes, exercise, so important, um, right? Just having one of those things that actually indicates some sort of Seder, that you live your life intentionally with purpose and priority, even if it's not your whole life, even if it's just one segment of it, there's some Seder, it, there's a starting point. It's life is not all of a, you know, a hodgepodge. You have values, you have priorities, you have a system of some kind, or at least the basis, the foundation for one. And if you don't, that's okay. Not to worry. Um, we can start small. For me personally, my non-negotiable is Shabbat. So for too many reasons to list now, Shabbat is not just something I keep because of my religious views and that I feel obligated to do it, but it's something that contributes significantly to my own life. And no matter how much food there is left to cook, when the clock hits candle lighting time, spatula is down. And no matter how many hundreds of dollars a flight might cost, uh, more, uh, if, you know, no matter how many, how many hundreds of dollars a, fl a flight that's a couple hours earlier might cost, so as not to violate Shabbat uh, in transit, for me, Shabbat will take priority, even if my bank account must take a hit. And if it takes too big of a hit, then maybe I'm going to have to forego on that vacation or that trip. Uh, and truth be told, this is probably... As I said, the Mida that I struggle with the most, Rav Wolby, our friend, our teacher, Rav Wolby talks about how a life lived with Seder is one in which we know what we want. We've mapped out how we're going to get there. And this is an important point of Seder. Seder requires to really dig deep and identify our purpose, our passions, our goals, our mission statement, if you will, as a first step. And then once we've identified that or mission statements, or goals or passions, then how can we align the ways that we live our life, right? In the ways that will help us achieve them. It's almost like having a job and constantly checking out the job description. And is what I'm doing today or at this moment, is that matching my job description? In a similar way, Seder says, you know, what is my, what is my 
my, my person description? What is my soul telling me to do? What are my passions? What are my values? And are the things that I'm spending my time doing right now, are they aligned with that? And honestly, beyond Shabbat, which is my anchor, I've, uh, I have to do some thinking. I have to do a lot of thinking as to where uh, I have Seder in my life. Uh, I don't know uh, what I want to do when I grow up, for example. As, uh, and as a result, I don't have a clear plan for how I'm going to get there. I think I'm making progress and I'm on some, some right track, but the end goal is amorphous. And as a result, it's hard to check in for me, uh, for me, Lauren, to see how I'm doing. A Seder also applies to our physical spaces. And though I more or less know where everything is, more often than not, it's hard for me to find my wallet, my keys, my medical bills, uh, because things are scattered around the floor, around the desk, or I put something somewhere and I think, oh, I'll remember it later. I'll remember it's there. And then, and then I don't. You get the point. <laughs> so I feel like my professional path lacks some Seder. My living quarters lack some Seder. Uh, and the one place I do have Seder, in addition to Shabbat, I think, is my calendar. And I learned this the hard way. I lost a friendship. I lost a friendship once because I was, I was always double booking and I would forget about plans I had with this one friend. And to them, this wasn't showing kavod. This wasn't showing kavod to them. And that friendship wasn't worth it for them. So, so it ended. And ever since then, I've tried to consistently maintain a very organized calendar. An organized calendar, you know, I still show up, you know, for, I still show up for things late from time to time. I need to work on Zrizut and Seder there. But having a calendar I use has been so helpful in at least feeling a small sense of Seder because I have so little Seder. So when I do have a little bit of Seder, when I write things down, when I clean my room right before Shabbat, et cetera, I know how great it feels. So, so those are my cards. I'm putting them out on the table for you. I have a lot of work to do on this Midah, but I hope you can still benefit and appreciate uh, our time today as we look to what the Musar masters have said about this Midah. Uh, and to my knowledge, they do speak from a place of expertise and practice. So I'll do my best to transmit some of their wisdom to our group here uh, and leave time for reflections after. So our Midah today, Seder, well, might be one that you are familiar with on some level uh, for those of us who, say, who celebrate Passover, right? For those of us who celebrate Passover, we might know the Seder means order. And additionally, the, the, the name for our prayer book is Sidur. Sidur, which comes from that very same word. Our prayer book comes from the word order, Seder, because our prayers are meant to be ordered in some fashion. They're not, you know, necessarily ecstatic or individual or spontaneous, but something that have some clear, consistent, shared form that allows us to bring our, both our individual selves to prayer, but also while doing it in step with one another. This Sidur was literally misudar. It was organized and arranged by a group of rabbis with intention. It wasn't just a comp compilation of sayings, you know, thrown together. In fact, the Kabbalists are very, very, very particular about the order in which they say the prayers because there's, they believe there's something holy and mystical about the prayer order for them. And similarly, the high holiday prayer books, they are called machzorim. It's not the same word as Seder, but machzor is literally a cycle. A cycle too is ordered. It's predictable. The cyclical year itself has an intentional structure and each holiday and the space between each holiday is marked in a meaningful way in Judaism. And it's always in conversation with one another and the seasons as well. So considering, I would say, the frequency of daily prayer using the Sidur and the seasonal holiday Machzor, and of course, the 75 plus percent of U.S. Jews, I believe, who celebrate Passover and, and do the Seder, order is no doubt an important part of our tradition and our daily life. But as you probably know, none of these, none of these works are fully fixed. Each has developed in many ways through the generations, some more obviously than others, but each allows room for, organi for customization for personal prayer and skipping sections here and there, depending on when you arrive at shul, when you arrive at synagogue or how much time you have to pray. We've seen this flexibility more recently in the Sidur, for example, during COVID, most clearly. We've seen prayer services shaved down to the bare bones. We've seen aliyot taken from one seat instead of going up to the bima. We've seen Zoom prayer services and individual Kaddish prayer customs and more throughout COVID. And any of us who have been to a Seder, a Passover Seder, um, know how far from organized such a thing is, um, both before it happens, before Passover begins, and certainly during the actual event. So the fact that within the order of the Seder, within the very order, within the Seder of the Seder, within the Seder of the Seder, there is built-in room for personalization and flexibility suggests, what it suggests is what we've seen before. 
with other midot, that order, the way we live our lives intentionally and purposefully with vision and some vision of a path ahead, that itself is a spectrum. We need some level of order in our Jewish lives. We need a prayer book, right, from which to pray and to enable a shared prayer experience with others, right? We can't have too, but at the same time, we can't have too much Seder. If we have too much Seder, we can't adapt to situations like we've seen in 2020 and 2021. As the sages say, we should be able to, to bend like a reed, but not be stiff, like a, and not be stiff like a cedar tree, right? But even, this, even the reed, even the reed cannot bend forever without snapping. Eventually the reed will snap too. So not enough order or too much flexibility is chaotic and ungrounded. Too much order is reifying. And it's susceptible to, to cracking and snapping under pressure. We know for ourselves, we only know for ourselves what's enough. You know, what is enough order to keep us on a course? And we know what kind of imposed order on us will just make us run in the other direction. So order here, like all the other Mido, is a spectrum. And it depends on who we are and, and, what, and how much order we need and how much order we really don't need. So what are the different types of order? Why is say what are the different types of order? Why is say there important? And how can we make you know a little headway into finding it? So to understand what order is or what the different forms of order, the different forms they come in, we were, we're gonna begin with Rav Eliyahu Dessler. Rav Eliyahu Dessler, there's a picture of him right here in the slide in the upper right. If you if you recall. And we're going to see him, by the way, in two weeks in our last session on Bechira, on choice, on, on choice points. If you recall, he presented this idea that we discussed a few weeks ago now, that to be in the divine image is to be a giver. That was our session on chesed. Right? To be a divine image means to be a giver. That was Rav Dessler. Rav Dessler, as a reminder, he was an early 20th century Musar master, born in Belarus, then to Israel. He studied in the famous Kelm Yeshiva. And his father... His father, Rav Dessler's father, was a student of another rabbi who we're going to see today. I think we're going to be introduced to him today, named Rab Simcha Zissel Ziv. Rab Simcha Zissel Ziv and Rab Simcha Zissel, we'll call him that for short, he was the founder of the Kelm Yeshiva. And the Kelm Yeshiva, or the Kelm Talmud Torah, the Kelm School, focused on the Midah of Seder as primary. Seder, order in the Kelm Yeshiva, that's really like... That is what they're known for, is order and discipline. And we'll see more about Rev Simcha Zissel in his yeshiva later. But before getting into Rev De but if we can, before getting into Rev Dessler, Rev Dessler has three definitions of Seder. Um, I just want to just share a few, a few other notes about Rev Simcha Zissel with Rev Dessler. He'll be, he'll be here very shortly. Um, as I mentioned, Rev Simcha Zissel, founder of the Talmud Torah of Kelm, Russia, 19th century. He was known Reb Simcha Zissel, and just as a reminder, Reb Dessler's father learned with Reb Simcha Zissel. So Reb Simcha Zissel's impact, influence, was certainly on Reb Dessler. Reb Simcha Zissel was known as the altar, or the elder of Kelm. He was, Reb Simcha Zissel himself, was a top student of Reb Yisrael Salanter, the founder of the Musar movement, right? So we have Reb Yisrael Salanter. One of his top students was Reb Simcha Zissel. One of Reb Simcha Zissel's students was Reb, Z Reb Dessler's father. So um, if you recall on our first session, our first session together, we mentioned there were three schools of Musar, right? One of them and the other two are more famous. There was the Slobotka Yeshiva, the Navardic Yeshiva, and the Kelm Yeshiva. And so in the, we said that Navardic emphasized the lowliness of a person, how we sin out of self-indulgence. And the goal is not to elevate ourselves, but to destroy the ego. That's what in psychology we call prevention-focused mindset. It's to destroy the ego. That's what we're trying to do. Novartic said, no, human beings are so great, right? We, if we work on our midot in a positive way, we can elevate ourselves. It's not about sort of pushing down the bad. It's elevating the good. That was Sobotka. And then we get to Kelm. And Kelm, again, founded by Reb Simcha Zissel, focused on discipline and order that, that having Seder in our lives, that would tame us in a way. Okay. Now we get to Rav Dessler. And inspired by the Kelm focus on Seder, he outlines three definitions of Seder. First, and I'll just, and I won't, and I put here my, uh, my translation more or less of what he said, but I'm just going to, to sort of paraphrase. 
right? First is Seder for its own sake. One definition of Seder, Seder for its own sake. The Seder which people delight in. If I understand him correctly, this type of Seder is like the Seder when you see books organized by color or you see a, a, a device, a home, uh, you know, some sort of device for the house that just, it's so clear what it does. And it's just so simple. There are all these Buzzfeed articles uh, that, that say like, if you, look at this, if you look at these pictures, you will feel like amazing just looking at it. That's the type of order. It's, it's something harmonious. Um, I, I just, I think of the image of the books, the books like all organized by color. You just look at them and you're just like, wow. Or if you look at a closet organized perhaps by color or by, by size of clothing, this is the first type of order. It's the type that's more aesthetically, aesthetically pleasing. That's one type of order. The second type of order is functional. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier with the keys and the wallet. This type of order, this type of Seder, it's a type that enables us to be effective and efficient human beings. It's the order that helps us know where everything is at a given point. This is another form of physical order. This is one. Uh, you know, it, it, this allows us to, to appreciate and know um, when, when, when we are not, I should say, when we are not looking around for all of our, all of our devices, right? When we know exactly where everything is, when everything is in a predictable, appropriate place, we have clean desks, we have clean floors, that saves us time. And it allows us to, to be more emotionally available, more, more psychological space um, for, for the pressure. Um, in a sense, it's against nature, right? Because as things generally move, things generally move from order to disorder. So the fact that to maintain this type of order is actually against nature. So it is difficult to both create and to maintain. But, and then the like, third form of, yeah. You know, when you were saying like organizing your closet by colors, that kind of thing, like, I don't, I don't do that. I, I don't know if many people do, but to me that almost borders on OCD, you know, is there... What are your thoughts about that? And is that healthy or unhealthy? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think for some people that's unhealthy and for some people it's healthy. These are just examples of, of what order could look like. What order could look like. This isn't, this isn't a everybody's, you know, everybody's house needs to look exactly the same, everybody's closet. This isn't Marie Kondo who says, you know, I have a, a method and here's what you do. This is more, um, but, but this is more about just at least for starting appreciating the different types of order in the world, um, even if not every type of it is for us. So this is not a prescription to, to go out and throw away the clothing that doesn't fit, uh, you know, the, the other clothing in the closet. So um, yeah, but, but I think we'll see later, I think that with, uh, with Rav Simcha Zissel, it actually does seem like at times there was a bit uh, of like an obsession uh, or a compulsion for cleanliness. And I think what Musar oftentimes does is gives us an extreme example. At least some of the Musar masters give us an extreme example. They might not have thought of it as extreme, but I think from our perspective, sometimes it feels like, oh, wow, like there's a story where Simcha Zissel gave a whole eulogy. It was almost a eulogy. It sounded like a eulogy to those who were there because he noticed that in the yeshiva where all the, all the shoes were supposed to be lined up, there was like one shoe that was out of order. And he was very, very upset about that. And it was, it was, people were stopped. Literally somebody had died. It was so serious. I think that's a little, that's a little much, um, but can I appreciate, you know, the deeper value of having things in order and making sure my shoes are, you know, aligned properly and not, you know, just, you know, thrown around. Yeah. So sometimes I think these examples, um, which might seem extreme, just are, are there to highlight a point, which we can learn from. Um, so just back to the, to Rev Des, so the third form of Seder, um, it's also functional, but it situates a person within a greater context. So this type of order, um, he paints a picture of a machine with all the different component parts, the gizmos and the gadgets and, 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 and that, that all you really, that all, all these pieces need to be in their proper places, doing their proper functions in order for the machine to work. So if you take a machine or a car to a shop when it's not working, chances are it's just you know, one or two parts that need a little bit of tweaking. So this type of Seder um, suggests that I need to know what my place is in the given social situation, right? I need to express my specialty as it were, or my unique talents at the right time. So this, I would say, is like more of an alignment with myself and my role and how I fit in to the broader context. So this is like a much deeper type of Seder and the one which Rav Dessler focuses on most. So I personally don't think these are three distinct types of order of Seder, but I do think they're, they're interconnected. 
right? When I am ordered in my physical space, I'm able to approach life with both confidence and without you know, these extra tabs open or without things cluttering my mind that need not be there. And without those extra tabs or things occupying my mind, my mind can be fully present and focused on the moment. And when I'm not present, when I'm not present, either because I have too much on my mind or because I'm not doing what I want to be doing or feel called to do, but rather feel the tension and the stress and the pain of being forced or pressured to do something, then the world and my relationships suffer. Meaning I can't play the role in this machine, not in a pejorative way, but I can't play the role, my role in this world, right? Which depends on me to play a certain role in order to function. Order affects not just me, it affects my relationships too. So even though Rav Dessler raises up the, this, third, this third machine model uh, as, as like the primary spiritual order that we're supposed to work on, I want to focus more on the physical and the practical, namely the second type, the second type of Seder. And we'll see shortly that I think this is a, you know, a false dichotomy anyways. So we just, we just unpacked what Seder is, the types of Seder. We said Seder is living life intentionally with a structure that facilitates that movement towards that intention and purpose. And that, that, that whenever we have structure in our lives, we need to have structure in our lives. It needs to be firm, but it needs to be flexible. And Seder can be manifest in different ways. It can be in our physical spaces. It could be in fulfilling our roles and our talents and our abilities and passions uh, that, that we're best situated to fulfill. Um, and it can be part of you know, an elaborate machine that, trans, that transcends any of us individually. We saw some practical benefits, I think, um, but we're going to go a, a little bit deeper now as to why. Why is Seder important? Why is Seder important? Why is order important? We saw some practical things. Let's go a bit deeper to the spiritual. Um, and Rav Wolbe and Rav Simcha Zissel, they are going to be our guides here. They're going to be our guides here. So turn to the slide here. So just want to start with a few, maybe a few more than a few, just um, words about Rav Simcha Zissel. And then we're going to, to speak to, uh, to Rav Wolby. So as I mentioned, Rav, Rav Simcha Zissel, and I'm only giving this bio because there are these names and these figures and some teachings. But I think when you actually know a bit about a person's biography or, or their quirks, um, you actually feel like you get to know them a bit. And that actually brings to life some of their teachings. So Rav Simcha Zissel, he was one of the, most, one of the top students of Rav Yisrael Salanter, one of the early leaders of the Musar movement. Uh, as I mentioned, he's one of the founders, founder of the, of the Kelm Talmud Torah. Uh, if you're curious really to learn more about him in depth, there's a great book called Bearing the Burden, uh, which comes from our word Savlanut, Bearing the Burden. Uh, Jeffrey Klausen, Professor Jeffrey Klausen wrote this amazing book. I read it actually before I was interested in Musar, so I should probably review it um, uh, with, with, my, with my new lens. And, um, and what's, what's important for us to know about Rav Simcha Zissel and the culture of the Kelm Talmud Torah is <clears throat> his emphasis on on discipline and seder, and at least one understanding, I guess, one understanding of seder, and and I would say the second step, really, of how we're going to define seder, it's the how to get there. So Reb Simcha Zissel, he, to my knowledge, I mean, there there was a there was a goal in mind, but what we can see from examples of the Kelm Talmud Torah is is the different ways that they actually implemented seder. So how they tried to get to Seder, the different physical things that they did. Um, and once, we've, once they've already established what they want in life. So however, as we'll see, discipline and order goes beyond any individual goal. Um, it in and of itself is valuable and suggestive. Seder, that is. So Kelm did not achieve the acclaim uh, or the longevity of Novartic and Slobodka, but that doesn't mean we don't still have a lot to learn from them. Um, Kelm wasn't about strictly highlighting the great potential of humans or the great dangers of the Yetzar Hara, like Sobotka and Novartic, uh, respectively, the way to internal spirit. Now, this is, this is I think, the key here. The way to, in, to internal spiritual growth was through Seder, was through Seder. The, how, how are we going to grow spiritually? Through Seder. And we're going to see like a great image comparing the world to the human about what will be shortly. Um, so Reb, Zim, Reb Simcha Zissel prioritized order. He also prioritize love of fellow human beings, Jews and non-Jews alike, which is really interesting. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's relatively innovative and, and rare to read people uh, with such love of humanity um, in the Jewish canon. Um, but but Reb Simcha Zissel, we can find a lot of that. 
Um, he really admired German culture. He really admired German culture and once said that Jews should adopt the German way of loving order and, understand the, and understanding the importance of honoring one's promises. He admired European decorum. And, you know, long coats. He, he even cut his side locks, his, his pace, rather than leaving them out hanging. Um, some people said he looked like a Protestant minister. I don't know. Um, and in his school, he placed a premium on, on cleanliness and Seder. So the, the, both the, in the dorm rooms and in public spaces, students had to keep their belongings in an ordered fashion. And they were required to keep their bodies clean, their clothing clean. And if you've ever been to a yeshiva more recently, you'll see this is not, <coughs> excuse me, it's not quite the case. Not quite the case these days. Um, you know, so as I mentioned, there was a there was a, a situation where where there was one you know one pair of boots that was out of out of line, and and there was a whole sermon that he gave to them. Um, and maybe you've heard this teaching uh, in your own communities that a study hall or a shul should have a window so that we can be connected to the outside world, and so that our Torah is always in conversation with the outside world. Reb Simcha Zizel had a bit of a different opinion or a different approach here. The windows that faced the street in the yeshiva were always closed for him because he wanted to avoid distractions. If someone was easily distracted, he felt it suggested some spiritual malady. If someone's easily distracted, there's something else going on. These days, I imagine he probably forbid phones and probably cut the internet. Uh, you know, people needed their, you know, unless people needed their computers to learn Torah. I don't think that'd be a terrible idea, um, but, but we can understand how distractions actually can take us away from, from the work that we're trying to do. Um, but we shouldn't be confused by the fact that all these are very external uh, forms of order in Seder. For Reb Simcha Zissel, order wasn't just a, an external character trait or expression. It was directly, directly related to moral growth and upkeeping our souls. One who kept their physical possessions and spaces clean could keep their insides, their souls clean as well. And one thing you do see in yeshiva today, at least the ones I've been in, is, is what's called Toranut. We also have this at camp. Uh, Toranut, so like shifts, taking care of the kitchen and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, public spaces, cleaning up. And back in Kelm, the school didn't even hire a custodian or a maintenance worker. The students themselves did the cleaning, but it wasn't like Toranut where it's like, oh, like, oh, I have to go, I, I want to switch my Toranut. I really don't want to do it. In Kelm, people were selected to clean and considered it an honor. It, it was considered an honor because it would cultivate the midot, some of them that we discussed last week, of anava, humility, right? Reminding myself that I'm not getting cleaned up after. I'm going to do the cleaning because I made the mess or my community made the mess. Savlanut, patience and bearing the burden, right? And of course, Seder, order. So we see from Reb Simcha Zissel, this deep connection between the physical and the spiritual order, Seder, and the idea that the physical Seder either signifies, suggests spiritual order, or it can help us get there. So why is it important? We'll share a metaphor for, from, from Reb Simcha Zissel um, about a necklace and a clasp. Maybe you've heard it before. Um, but first, let's get to Rav Wolby. So Rav Wolby, who's more recent, as I mentioned, 20th century, died maybe 20, 15, 20 years ago. He notes and this is going to sound like it's out of left field for a second, but, but bear with me. He notes that there are many, well, I'll note that there are many common arguments for God. I don't want to get into any of them uh, because I don't find them particularly interesting. I don't find them necessarily convincing or emotionally exciting. I believe what I believe. Um, one of these arguments, though, when understood in a different context, in our Seder context, can help us understand the importance of order and Musar. So Ravulbi points out that the whole world is ordered points out that the whole world is ordered. There are laws of physics and there are laws of chemistry and biology and astronomy. The sun rises, the sun sets, the seasons, they come and go in most places, not so much Los Angeles, and I'm not sure what's going on in Arizona these days, right? But at least there's a level of predictability and level of order. And our bodies, our bodies work in miraculous ways. And there are always, always, always unforeseen events. Um, there are, there's plenty of, in my opinion, plenty of disorder in this world that we have to reckon with. Um, you know, we don't know. We don't know when a certain earthquake is going to strike. And we don't know how devastating and extensive, uh, you know, a natural disaster might be. And we don't know when our bodies are going to act up and surprise us and we have to go to the doctor. And yet so much of the world, so much of the world is ordered and is consistent. 
And it's the very order of the universe, the very order of the universe that gives us stability and allows us to point out when things are in disarray. Those who want to prove God will say that an ordered universe, and Ravobi says this, Aristotle says this, that 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 those that um that when the when we look at the world and we see it's ordered, what that suggests is that somebody has ordered it, that there is an orderer, there is an organizer, some willpower is behind this order. The world began, according to the Torah, the world began in chaos, tohu vavahu, and God moved around the pieces, maybe introduced a few new ingredients to create this world that we have now. A certain will, according to Ravobi, can be inferred and detected from the order in the world that we see. And in the Republic by Plato, if I recall correctly, Plato helps derive these larger principles about the world and the forms that transcend humanity from the individual person. In Musar though, as we've seen, we tend to do the opposite. We look out at the world, we see how it's structured, we see the large world, and then we bring it down to us. From the large world, to the small world, our world. So with this thinking, as we are part of the large world, what follows is that when we have order in our own world, we demonstrate that we have a will, our own, and an intention, our own, behind what we do, how we spend our time, who we are, in the same way that the world, if we can say that the world has order and therefore there's something, a willpower sort of organizing it, the same applies to our own lives. When we are ordered, we are in control. When our living spaces are a mess, one might ask, who lives here, right? Is anyone home? Hello? When our minds feel you know, scattered, scatterbrained, or, or our days are unplanned, we might, we might not know exactly who's behind the wheel. Order in our lives is like order in the universe. And disorder in our lives is like disorder in the universe. So the question really is, who is in charge of our lives? When we are in charge, we can see that in the seder of our lives. When we aren't in charge, and we all know that feeling of not being in charge, not knowing what to do, and it's very hard to gather everything together. So that's one reason why seder is important, because it's a sign that we have direction and we have willpower. When we have a set time or a time slot for bed, for exercise, for waking up, for meals, this demonstrates that we are not living in this you know, free-for-all without any values or priorities, but right? having some structure in our lives, some habits, some predictability, some order, some say there, this is what Ravulbi wants us to remember. Ravulbi also wants us to take ownership, he wants us to take ownership over our lives, to demonstrate that willpower. This requires us, Ravulbi says, to first establish, we have to first establish what it is we want. We have to set goals. And second, we have to figure out how we're going to get there. Of course, we don't have to do this alone. We can always ask and use support. This isn't something that we just do in our own, sort of in, the, in our own heads. To live in an ordered life, where Volby says, is to live in a life that we are directing. We have clear, we have achievable goals that we, with our free will, have established, and we aim to fulfill them. This applies to our work lives, it applies in relationships, and it most certainly applies in our personal internal work, even in Musar. For midot, we need to determine which midah or midot we feel like we need to work on. That's a, that's, that's, we first need to, to, to decide what midah do I work on and then figure out which practices are going to help us get there one step at a time. So seder, in a sense, is a prerequisite really for any work of Musar. So the second reason, second reason, and I love this image, and the reason why I love this so much is because we have these images. We have this image of the world and, the, and, the, you know, and this will behind it. And we have our own worlds and the will behind it. Um, we have this other image and it helps us remember it, I think, and really connect to it. The image that Rav, De, Rav, uh, Rav Simcha Zissel brings. Uh, actually, it's Rav Simcha Zissel. I didn't see it originally in Rav Simcha Zissel, but I saw it quoted by Rav Wolby in the name of Rav Simcha Zissel. So he says we need to understand it, Seder, as he says we have to look at a necklace. <clears throat> we should imagine a necklace of pearls, he says. Each of the pearls is on a string. And each of the pearls represents our strengths, our gifts, our relationships, our midot, our goals. All of us. And all of these indeed are pearls, right? They are what we value in life, what we want to hold on to, perhaps what we, what we want to show off even. We put these pearls 
on a string, a necklace, but that's not enough because every necklace needs a clasp. And that clasp, according to Reb Simchazissel, that clasp is Seder. The clasp of the necklace is Seder. That is order. Without the clasp, all of the pearls will fall. And then we're left with, you know, uh, a little schwach string and pearls scattered all over the room. And assuming, I guess if we have a bunch of stuff on the floor, the pearls aren't going to go very far. But let's say the floor is clear and all these pearls fall over the place. We're not going to find it. Rolling down the stairs, who knows where. Without the clasp, without Seder, all of our strings, all of our gifts, our relationships, they are not actualized. We can have an amazing intellect, can be super smart, but unless the person knows like what interests them and how to pursue those interests and a confidence to do so, that intellectual power, in a sense, goes, goes to waste. One could be a social person, have a large network, but unless they keep a responsible schedule of when to see who, don't overplan and write down their plans, those relationships are going to suffer. One might be, a, I don't know, a hard worker with lots of, lots of potential to benefit any employer, lucky to have them. But unless they have a clear plan for identifying the right jobs for them, applying to those jobs and following through, that person's gift is hidden. And on a most literal level, if one has a beautiful living space with an open floor plan, perfect for some combination of hosting large meals, exercising, you can make, it, you make your home your gym, and who knows what else, if the space is cluttered and messy, there's no Seder there, what good is that space, right? You can barely even use it. So Seder is the clasp. Order Seder holds the pearls together, allowing them to shine and fulfill their purpose, whether in our physical spaces or our intra or interpersonal lives, a lack of Seder can be very, very costly. I tell you this from experience, and I imagine others of us here know this as well. And to maximize these gifts that we have and the potential, we need Seder. We need order. Rav Yisrael Salanter has a saying that to me highlights the importance of Seder in one's life before anything. He says that one should first find order in one's house, then one's town, and then the world. All of us, we could have these special talents that can reverberate outwards and really make a difference in the world and perfect the world. But unless we have Seder at home, in our own homes, in our own selves, we can't move outwards. We have to first focus on the home inside. And I think any of us who've been in relationships too know how important home life is. Uh, home life is, and that actually affects our relationships with other people. To review, before opening it up, we started with the most frequent and overt interactions with Seder in Judaism, namely prayer, the Sidur, Seder, Sidur, the, most, the ordered prayer book, the Machzor, the cyclical prayer book, the Haggadah, the Passover, Seder. Passover order, which is actually quite disorderly. We learned that that, that Seder, that structure uh, is there, right? But it's it, that we need structure in our lives, but it's flex, but we need to be flexible. Seder asks us to balance the chaos of the world that would that the world would be if left to its own devices with you know this military style discipline. I would say, Randy, to your point earlier, that the Kel Yeshiva order is probably not going to be best for, for, mo for most of us. But um, but at least we have at least we have something that you know, an image of what order could be and maybe what we want to avoid. Um, and then we turn to Rav Dessler, who gave us three models of order of Seder, the symmetry of the world, the pleasant uh, order of fractals, if you will. Perhaps we don't want to line up all of our books or our clothing by color, but fractals, if you've seen a fractal, those things are gorgeous, right? That's maybe one type of order. Um, we saw the second type of order, which was having everything in its right place. So we don't waste time or energy or bear any unneeded stress in finding those things to complete our activities. I put a well-structured calendar here as well. And lastly, the significance of order number three uh, in our life is, is, is more about the grander scheme of things, how the world, our communities are a machine of sorts, a beautiful machine, not like a cog in a machine, but, but we have a meaningful role to play in this machine. Um, and we need to be present. We need to be ordered in order to help it run. We all matter. We all matter here. And order in our life reverberates outwards as it allows us to contribute. Once our own house is in order, we can venture out. We looked at why Seder is important. We saw Ravulbi's explanation about the small world and the big world, right? Just as the larger world has this order and structure and Ravulbi believes that, was, that there's a, a, a willpower behind it, the same can be said about our own lives. The same can be said about our own lives. When we have an order and structure, 
that shows that we ourselves are in the driver's seat. We're living an active and an intentional life. And when we don't, we're on cruise control. And that generally doesn't go so well. Only either because we're going to go off a cliff or because people are honking at us. I'm not sure. I've never actually done it, but I can imagine. Um, and this structure can be manifest practically in times of the day we set aside for certain activities. Maybe we have a bedtime or a wake up time, a time of the day we work out or a certain workout, or a certain workout routine that we do and we stick to it. Maybe we have a time to study Torah. All of us here, 4 p.m. for 10 weeks on Thursdays, or I guess it's 2 p.m. by you, 4 p.m. by me here, um, right? You have a time. This is something you're coming to every week, right? This is, this is a form of order. I'm having a Torah study once a week at this time. That is Seder, right? Nothing beyond one's realistic capabilities, though. People these days, right, a lot of times they time box their calendars. Rav Vulbi suggests basically doing the same thing. And then the second approach was that of Rav Simcha Zissel about why Seder is important. We saw uh, the clasp that holds together the pearls, the talents, the gifts, the relationships, all of our mido together. So when our lives are in order, when we have structure, when we have gold, the pearls can shine. And when we are unguided, undirected, lost or unfocused, those pearls can slip off the string and our potential goes to waste. In a moment, we'll open it up for some discussion about Seder in our own lives. But I want to share with us a midrash that I hope, a rabbinic interpretation that I hope can actually give those among us who, have, who live lives that are a bit more chaotic, who feel a bit more disordered, uh, perhaps a bit of comfort, and to actually show that that chaos, that disorder too, is a value. So it's a beautiful midrash. And the midrash reads the following. In the way of the world, if a king or a queen of flesh and blood builds a palace in the place of sewers, trash, and refuse, like Washington, D.C., anyone who comes and says, literally, anyone who comes and says, this palace is built in the place of sewers, trash, and refuse, wouldn't that be considered an insult? So too, one who comes and says, the world was created from unformed void and darkness, tova bahu, chaos and disorder. Wouldn't that be considered an insult? Right? First there was chaos and disorder. Now there's an order of world. The, the analogy there is, it's as if this world is built on, on trash, on chaos. Rav Huna, in the name of Bar Kapara said, Rav Huna, in the name of Bar Kapara said, were it not written in the Torah, it would not have been possible to say, God created the heavens and the earth from what? From and the earth was unformed, void, etc. According to this teacher, this teaching, disorder is critical. Disorder is important. It's the bedrock of this world. It's what was required for order to emerge in the first place. Like this Midrash initially understands it, chaos and disorder inhibits us. It's gross. It's smelly. It's what we want to be far away from. But then the Midrash says something else that actually tohu vavohu, chaos and disorder, is necessary. It's necessary. Having an unformed, unvo an, un an, like an unformed, is an unformed world, but perhaps unformed goals, unformed schedules, all that is actually necessary. And confronting it is necessary. If we want to move to a place of seder in our lives, we need to acknowledge that which already exists. And that is disorder. That is tov avo. That's the chaos. And once we acknowledge where that disorder is, we come to terms with it, then we can try our best to rearrange it, to create more order. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up if we don't have the order in our lives that we seek. We should first acknowledge that, first of all, as we did in the beginning, first acknowledge that we do have some small, at least some small hint of seder in our lives somewhere. Maybe the Seder is you brush your teeth every day or you floss every day. I don't know, right? But we need to first acknowledge that there is some Seder, some Seder in our lives, some of us more than others. We also need to acknowledge that we have disorder in our lives. And once we've acknowledged that disorder, we've befriended it in a certain way. Hey, disorder, come on in. Like, let's, let's work together here. We're going to build something, right? Then we can work to increase our Seder. The Zohar and Chabad Hasidus actually say that Chaos is actually on a higher spiritual level than Seder. Yeah. I don't want to go that far. I don't think we should idolize a, a, a chaos, but, but just to acknowledge that there is a value to it um, and that we don't need to see it as smelly and gross, something to run away from, but something rather to approach and to reckon with. So in our next few minutes, I want to open up with some questions. But 
want to sort of do a form of meditation, form of some questions, I want to ask some questions. I put in this document a few different questions that you could think about to like sort of assess your own order in your life. We're going to go off the page though. So I want to still close our eyes for just a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes, close your eyes, relax. I'll do the talking. You do the, you do the focusing, just get comfortable, get comfortable. As we said, Seder's living our lives intentionally. It's knowing our life's mission statement and aligning all of what we do to that mission. Seder is setting boundaries, following discipline, knowing when we need to keep working at something and when it's time to give it a rest, especially when what we're doing now conflicts with the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. Seder is big. It's where we want our life to go. But it also pops up and is worked on in the day-to-day -day, from scheduling our days and weeks to be sure that we have time to see the people we want to see, to do the things that help us feel fulfilled. Doing the dishes before bed, picking up the clothes off the floor, physically ordering our spaces. There's something for everyone in the work of Seder. And we all start from different places and need different things. And we need to crack it take a crack at it one day at a time. So with that in mind, keep your eyes closed. I want us to reflect on Seder order in one aspect of your life. It could be work, home, school. The first question is, where do you feel like you have a healthy measure of order of Seder? Where do you feel, okay, yeah, I have some Seder there. Now, I want you to think for the next few seconds about where do you wish you had a bit more Seder? Where do you wish you had a bit more order in your life? And staying with this, 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 this part of disorder in our lives, just for a few, for a little bit, what are the costs? What are the costs of that disorder? How is it hurting you? And lastly, what is one small action you think you can take to introduce a little bit more say there into this part of your life? One small action you can take to introduce a little bit of say there into your life. I invite you to open your eyes, come back together. And I'd love to hear from, from uh, you know, if any of, as many of us want to speak about where, where you feel like you could have a little bit more order in your life. I'll share. Um, I seem to have some disorder with my time management. And um, I've, I've been like this, you know, my whole life. And I feel like I, you know, I have to read the newspaper every day. And then with 75 emails that come in every day, it, it's like, like kind of the fear of missing out. Now, and it's not personal emails. It's, JTA, JNS, it's Times of Israel. It's all the, it's the Arizona Republic. It's, it's like, 
I'm a, like, I feel like I got to, and then let alone the stuff I have to do that doesn't involve the computer, you know, just, so I, I think the thing that I could do is just delete some emails, you know, without reading them, but it's, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's been difficult for me. Um, it's not that important that I read the paper, but that's, I make it a priority. And I, so if anyone has any suggestions, <laughs> I'm open. Thank you, Randy. I, I don't know if we're going to get into to some practical suggestions at this very moment. Um, I do know there are a lot of resources online and I'm, I'm sure we can direct you to some, but I think it's at least just important and perhaps it's something you've, you've known about your whole life. Um, I don't know how often you share with other people, um, but I think at least just acknowledging it, you know, out in the open um, is, you know, I think sometimes just reminding ourselves that we are disordered in that way is an important step because a lot of times like the painful things we just ignore and then we don't address them. Um, so I think just, just acknowledging them keeps it top of mind, allows us to actually make, you know, a small step to, to addressing it. Thank you for sharing. What do you do to turn your brain off? That's my question to you, Randy. Uh, what, uh, to me? Yeah, because I have a, like, I have a problem when I'm, let's say overwhelmed or stretched too thin or I have too much on my plate. You know, I, I work, I volunteer, I'm social with people and I project as extroverted, but I'm really more introverted. Like when I need time to myself, my body and my brain will tell me that. And I will just have to take a moment away from it all and be like, okay, that's where I'm at max capacity. Do you have any outlets? Like I, I read or I play the piano or I'm in sports or whatever the case may be. Do you have any outlets where you're just away from email and your computer? Um, well, Shabbat, you know, I, I do not go on, I don't do email on Shabbat. Um, but, you know, because I'm, retired and my kids are out of the house I'm not as busy as you are um but but uh I think even when I do get busy I um I'll maybe just try to take a few minutes and meditate um if I'm um I also I'm in the middle of watching Schitt's Creek and sometimes <laughs> I'll just you know just say forget it I'm taking 20 or 40 minutes I'm just gonna watch a couple episodes of Schitt's Creek so um, just uh, closing my eyes, taking a nap. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah, TV is my turn my brain off thing too, um, depending on how invested I get. But yeah, just curious. Yeah, you know, there's this idea of always preparing, you know, everything we're doing is preparing for Shabbat. Um, there's idea, but I think there's perhaps also an idea that that Shabbat is meant to, to prepare us for the week. And I wonder, you know, what would it be like to say, you know, I'm going to do 10 minutes of Shabbat every day to do 10 minutes of Shabbat. Right. And so what that means, you know, unplugging or taking a nap, like that's, that's you bringing Shabbat into the week. And to the extent that Shabbat is a taste of the world to come, um, you know, as long as we're not running away from the world uh, that needs, that needs fixing. I think we think it can be very healthy to bring in, you know, a Shabbat practice, you know, a Shabbat moment, uh, Shabbat minute, Shabbat hour uh, into every day. Do you find time for that, Rabbi? Yeah, um, I, I certainly, I certainly have in the past when I really needed it. Um, these days, I'm I'm trying to wake up early, actually, because um, I find that that oftentimes my I don't stick to my schedule. You know, I'm not sticking to my workout schedule. I'm working more hours than maybe I should be working. Um, so I try to wake up a little bit earlier, and that way I sort of shift my schedule back a little bit. So if I want to finish at you know six o'clock at night, like I do that on the spot. And then I, and then I turn off my computer. I don't, I don't, I don't power it off. I just close it. Um, but I, but I really try to not engage too much with, with effortful emails, um, you know, checking in, you know, like a yes, no response here and there by email after hours. Yeah, I can do. Uh, but I try not to really, you know, to do the work, the, the emails that really require a lot of thinking for me, like that's a form of Shabbat, you know, at 5 PM, 6 PM, whatever it is, 7 PM depends on the day, you know, once I'm done, I'm done. Um, and I need to take these next, you know, three to four to five hours until bed, um, you know, for myself. 
Alex or Yehuda, anyone else wanna? I think wanna... like for me, I have to remember that it's kind of all about priorities in my life because I can definitely find, create order. I can prioritize everything from Rick rolling on TikTok, you know, just watching all that, you know, crazy videos to Netflix to like really making it a point to say like, you know, I want to study every day for a little bit. It doesn't have to be like an hour, but even 30 minutes just to read something, study something. Um, for me, it's trying to establish more of a consistent prayer life. And it's hard to get up at like 5.30, 6 in the morning for me. So I have to like really make it a point and say like really stick to it and not like put up some hard, like uh, hard boundaries, if you will, like, okay, I'm absolutely going to do this because as soon as I kind of, you know, give in a little bit, it just gets a little bit harder to sort of stick to that expectation and it doesn't become a routine. So that's what I'm working on. I, th I think like the, the notion of one day at a time, you know, it's not like you're, you know, if you're, you know, just today, today, here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to learn today instead of, you know, every day. I'm going to try to learn today, you know, yeah. Mondays and Tuesdays at 3.30 p.m. or whatever, whatever it is. I think just sort of, yeah, seeing, seeing it in, in more digestible chunks. And also, you know, two week, you know, there are these two week plans and 30 day, you know, and 100 day challenges. Like the reason why they do that is because, you know, it, it's first of all, it's quantifiable. It's not indefinite. You, you have an idea, you know, you're going to have a, um, a moment of milestone. Mm. Um, so I think that, you know, even, even thinking about these, you know, the, the, the seven day, you know, Shabbat challenge, I don't know where you're going to do Shabbat for 10 minutes a day, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, you know, sometimes, sometimes structuring it in a certain way, um, where, you know, yeah, I think there, I think there are like a lot of different ways that people will, try to do these things, but yeah. it all, but it depends on the person. I'm not a morning person myself and I hate waking up in the morning um, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, but I would say that right now it's working because I'm, I'm still like sort of jet lag or I'm forcing myself to be jet lag. But if I'm on normal time, yeah, it's going to be very difficult to wake up early. Yeah. Yehuda, do you want to, do you want to share anything about sort of disorder? You know, what you're, what you're working on? Oh gosh. Well, we were talking about this and I'm thinking, you know, my house is just an absolute disaster. There's stuff piled everywhere and I need to declutter and clean out and everything. You know, I used to be very, very organized and I was a bit of a workaholic and stuff. And after I retired, it's like, I became very unorganized and, and, and hard to, keep up with things and I just you know just even sitting down at the desk to get my bills and paperwork in order it just seems like I'm back at the office and it ah. so but I was thinking as we're talking about all of this you know I'm much better at my prayers and Shabbat and and studying whatever I'm working on whether it's Hebrew or uh Torah and portions and and so I think I've I've shifted some of my organization my seder so and I think it's shifted so so that's something that I'm using to not beat myself up so much about the messy house. <laughs> Great, thank you, Yehuda. Yeah, I, no, and I I think that's 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 part of the point, right? It's not like you either do have order or you don't have order, right? We have some order in more parts of our lives than others and like that's again it's okay um you know as for one one per, i guess if, you know in the practical i i know uh one way i've heard of, of helping to clean up spaces is focusing and this is similar to the one day at a time but but more physically more physical spaces you know one area at a time right it's not like you have a whole house you have to clean up it's no just this corner right or just these you know a few square feet um but um but yeah i think i think there is really though you know, to what I said earlier, truth to like this idea that like when every, like when the physical is ordered in our lives, um, that, that frees up a lot of space for, for us to focus on, you know, I guess, I guess you, you've kind of gone in the other direction. You're, you have your prayer and your Shabbat's all good, uh, but the physical is, you know, less, less so. Um, yeah. But, but, um, but the idea that, 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 that our physical order does reflect something, something internal and that it can, that physical order can, um, you know, empower, enhance our spiritual lives that, 
that when our lives are in order more broadly, when, you know, when we are feel like we are in alignment with, with ourselves and, and our motivations and our goals, when we're doing, um, are actually serving those, um, that actually demonstrates, I think, like a divine will inside of us too, right? In the same way that Rev Dessler says that God is a giver, so we're a giver. Um, similarly, I think, you know, if God is, is a willpower and God is an organizer, sort of, you know, putting all the pieces together, right? In a way, when we have Seder in our lives, um, I think we also can bring out that divine image in some ways um, as well. So thank you all so much for, for coming to learn together again. I look forward to uh, seeing you next week. We'll be learning about emunah and bitachon, which could be like faith and trust, loosely translated. Uh, and then that'll be our ninth session. And then our last session will be on Bechira, which is about choices, about choices and, and also like a sort of summary wrap up um, of, of all we've done together over the last uh, two and a half months or so. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.